it will be a huge breakthrough. Um, and who knows what else is down there? They, they even think it has effects on other kinds of cancer cells. I mean, really, we need extra cell phone batteries that bad? We got to step up here. All right, we're back for a bonus round with Susan. And uh, we just started talking offline. We're like, let's go and, and, and have a little bit more of a conversation. And it started off with talking a little bit about what's next. And one of the things that she was just sharing was um, one of the most important things that most people don't understand what's going on in the ocean. And I'll just give you the floor to share a little bit more with them. Well, uh, in, in my book about the deep, deep ocean, the underworld, I write a chapter about uh, deep sea mining. Now, some people have heard of it. Some people haven't. It hasn't happened. It doesn't occur right now in the ocean on any sort of industrial scale, but it is it looks like it might be happening. It, it looks like it might be imminent. And one of the reasons why I wrote about it and why I spent a long time thinking about it, researching it is because it, it has the potential to be the most destructive thing that we've ever done on earth. Like not just by a little bit. Um, and it's kind of complicated and kind of political. Um, so I wanted to try to put it in a sort of a narrative form so that people could really understand it without having to make the kind of horrifying deep dive that I made. So essentially what it is, is that it is what it sounds like. You would be strip mining the seafloor and there are three different kinds of deep sea mining, but the first one, um, and they're all awful, but the first one is it, uh, to basically think of a forest being clear cut, but you take the top 20 feet of topsoil too. And that's what they would be doing on the seafloor to get these little nodules um, that form at certain depths on um, abyssal plains. So 15,000 feet in certain areas of the ocean, there are these really cool metal orbs. And if you think of how pearls grow the, around a nucleus and it takes forever for them to grow, that's what happens, but with metals. So there might be like a fossilized shark's tooth. And then over literally tens and hundreds of millions of years, you might get something that becomes the size of say a plum or an orange. And if you cut it in half, you would find cobalt, manganese, copper, nickel, and some other trace minerals. But it isn't completely inert. There's microorganisms that live inside it, under it, on it. So in a way, it's like trees and corals more than, say, lumps of rock. And these are very, um, we don't know what their purpose is in the ocean. We know they take a really long time to form. Um, we don't, microbes are involved in the process. Nobody understands exactly how. And so this first phase of deep sea mining would just be to take these nodules and um, ironically, the purpose would be because the cobalt and nickel to create electric car batteries to give us a greener quote unquote future. But there's all kinds of problems with this. And the major one is that we don't even understand the ecosystem that we would be destroying. We haven't got the slightest clue what its role is in the sort of biochemistry of the ocean. We don't know any of the species. It would disrupt the sediments that have all this microbial life that are doing like really heavy lifting in terms of bioregulation, carbon cycling. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very bad idea to do this. Once these nodules are gone, they can't be replaced. They, they're gone on human time scales. Like, you know, anything approximating human time scale, you never get these back. So, um, you know, it's, it's, incredibly unwise thing to do. And because it looks like uh, the, the, the waters that would be mined first, seafloor would be beneath the waters uh, of the high seas. So that whole thing is kind of administrated by this group called the International Seabed Authority under the UN. Um, countries that signed the law of the sea have a vote in this, but it's not a very democratic group and it's been captured by corporate interests. So um, scientists are kind of racing to figure out how to stop this. They've asked for a moratorium of 10 to 30 years to at least just to figure out, like, what would we even be doing? What would happen? Like, um, what would we lose? So that seems like the very least we could do. Um, and of all the things that I learned about that I don't like that happen in the ocean, like incredibly amounts of plastic filtering down even to the very deepest trenches, you know, reckless industrial fishing, this just puts them all in the shade. This, the average mine site would be 30,000 square miles. Um, and there are a lot of countries that are really anxious to do this. China's one of them. Norway's one of them. 
But there are also a lot of countries that are asking for a pause, a, a precautionary pause, a moratorium. Um, and interestingly, the U.S. didn't ratify the Treaty of the Law of the Sea, so we're not a player in this. So it's really hard to even tell people, like, okay, what do you do uh, to stop this? But I have been referring people to this group called the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, and um, their website is savethehighseas.org. And they have fact sheets and they have all kinds of news about the progress of this. And so far, so good. We've managed to prevent it from happening this summer, which is when it was supposed to start. Um, and many big companies like Google, Samsung, BMW, Volvo have um, understood that uh, it, it's not okay to do this and have vowed not to use seabed minerals in their supply chains until the, at the very least we understand what the impact of this would be. Um, but, you know, I like to think of it as a kind of a wisdom test. I mean, it, this is a very big carbon sink. Um, are we actually going to reach down through three miles of seawater and gouge up the seafloor in an environment that is pretty pristine. I mean, it's not completely untouched because it's got our microplastics, it's got our persistent organic pollutants, but it's largely untouched. And we haven't done that much there. Um, and I feel like all of a sudden you're going to be bringing noise, light, vibration, sediment clouds. None of the creatures are adapted to this. All of the creatures in the mining area would be killed. Um, they would spew out the detritus from this into the twilight zone. So all of a sudden this very clear water where everybody's communicating with bioluminescence would be filled with a haze 24 hours a day, 365 days a year of sediment being redeposited, not at the seafloor, but in the mid water. The whole thing is just a nightmare. Um, and so I really try to make people as aware of it as I can. I think that we can stop it. I think the ocean will also have a say in this, but, um, God, I hope we can stop it. Well, I can feel your like, your like how serious this is. You know, for somebody that that doesn't see it, and they're like, "Well, you know, it doesn't really affect me. I'm landlocked and stuff." Like, the how do you help them make the connection that you are connected to this? I mean, you know, the ocean runs everything. It runs every system on the planet. It runs the climate. I mean, the other the thing that you advocates of this will say is that okay, well, it's very. Uh, destructive to mine on land. And it is. And we could do a much better job of that. Cobalt in particular is really ugly. There's child labor. There's all this stuff. But keep in mind that even if we wipe away this whole area that's between uh, Mexico and Hawaii called the Clary and Clipperton zone, which has these nodules, it's scheduled to be mined first if it starts, um, it won't replace any terrestrial mines. It would only add a fraction to the global output of both cobalt and nickel. So it wouldn't be like we suddenly don't have to deal with the ugliness of terrestrial mining. Um, also, because it's, like it's not really, it's not outweighing the benefit. Like it's not like it's the amount of things that are being destroyed for what we're getting. It just doesn't seem no. what you're describing. It doesn't seem. No. Like and you know, it's just so many um, uncertainties and risks and um, particularly in a time when we really need the natural carbon capturing systems that are still intact to remain intact. We need to just, to create more of them too. Um, but also because cobalt is such a nasty thing to mine, um, a lot of battery manufacturers and are trying to move away from the chemistry of cobalt and nickel. And Tesla, I think, is really trying hard to move away from cobalt. So five years from now, who knows what metals we're going to need more of. It may not be these metals, but once this starts, it's going to be really, like, once the door is kicked open, it's going to be really hard to shut it. And again, this this International Seabed Authority is pretty unaccountable to you or me. I mean, this is all supposed to be done, quote unquote, for the benefit of mankind. But to me, that means we should have a vote in whether or not it happens. And at this particular moment, in, we we can only as consumers just refuse mm -hmm. to accept this. Um, I mean, I that that's that's the best I can do at this particular moment. And just raising awareness um, and sending people to get more information because yeah, it's, it's, um, it's the potential, the destructive potential of it is just off the charts. And you're suggesting also the unintended consequences. We have no idea. Yeah. And this, we're, we're just playing with something that we, 
we don't know what's going to go out of balance here by doing something this dramatic. Well, and so much of the, the what would be disturbed is microbial, and 80% of the microbial life on Earth is in the ocean, and a lot of it's in the deep ocean, and as I said, even beneath the seafloor. And these microbes are ancient and doing really unusual things. They will be the source of all kinds of new biomaterials, new medicines. Like we have so much to learn from these sediments. And also not to mention, it's the history of the paleoclimatology of the earth. Like wrecking the sediments is not like kicking over a, sand, a pile of sand. They're completely alive and they contain uh, like earth's DNA database, deep archive mm -hmm. of genomic creativity and um, strategies for resilience. I mean, it's just really heedless, reckless um, to do this. And uh, I just think it's, it's a wisdom test. We got to pass one, one of these yeah. days. It's like, it's, to me, the parallel is like the, the loss of the rainforest in Brazil, how many medicine uh, that, uh, you know, that, that could be created natural medicine, we could be destroying by doing that. And I think that's another argument is like, what, what possible new resourceful way that we could create more better life on, on earth with what's there than destroying what's there. Yeah. And we should have learned. And just to give you an example of the type of thing that might be found um, at abyssal depths in the Atlantic Ocean, um, about 20 years ago, scientists found a microbe that creates a compound that they've been uh, working with, um, and it will be the first uh, sort of natural marine medicine. It kills glioblastoma cells dead. Uh, and glioblastoma is this, it, it, today has been this incurable brain cancer. It's the cancer that killed John McCain. And these, uh, there's so many strategies for survival for these microbes. And this microbe, it in fact, not it, it's in its final clinical trials. Um, <clears throat> it will be a huge breakthrough. Um, and who knows what else is down there? They, they even think it has effects on other kinds of cancer cells. I mean, really, we need extra cell phone batteries that bad? I mean, can't we recycle the ones we've got a little bit better? I, the whole thing is just, we got to step up here. Well, I'm going to make sure the the word gets out. Thank you for giving this little bonus extra amount. I'll make sure that we distribute it as almost like a little little beacon of support for you as well. But um, it sounds to me like maybe there's a another book about microbes because <laughs> you really you know it's interesting. I would love to do it if I could figure out a way to make them characters. I mean, I'm always um, I feel like when I'm writing about science, I want to tell a story. I want to take readers on an adventure. So it's, you know, it's not daunting. I'm trying to make this, of a, you know, everybody has so much competition for their time and uh, their energy, what they spend their attention on. So, you know, we got to have a good story. How do I make microbes characters? If I can figure out how if to do that. anybody can do it, you can. Yeah. You know, you already did. You're already the way you're describing. I was like, uh, there's none of it that was uninteresting to me. You made me very interested in this topic, so. Thank well, you. you know, I'm still learning how to talk about it without completely freaking out. <laughs> yeah. It's so awful. Oh. Uh, well, thank you so much for the work and you I do. And we can stop it. So. And, and, and uh, we'll do our best to sh share this wherever we can. And um, if you want to uh, afterwards, just send me all the links that you want me to add to the, I'll make this as a separate little post. Sure. And uh, just maybe just to review, what would be the address that people should go to? Savethehighseas.org. Save the high seas.org. There you have it. It's a great all in one spot to learn more, to see what's new in this, um, in this, it's a fight. This is a battle. Um, and it's ongoing. It's happening now. So yeah, it'd be great for people. And I think the chapter in my book, I really spent a long time sort of like trying to encapsulate it all into this one narrative chapter. It comes near the end of the book and on purpose, right? Because by then, you know, what's at stake. You've traveled through these various depths of the ocean. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Till next time, mahalo again.